Jessica Williams walked through the hallways of the Maplewood Police Station, a small town in Vermont, with a serious and determined expression. Her brown eyes observed every detail around her, from the dusty files to the colleagues passing by, some with looks of disdain or indifference. Ah, Lieutenant Williams. Are you going to save us today with your feminine intuition, mocked Detective Mark Thompson, a veteran of the police force who never missed an opportunity to belittle Jessica. Better than having no intuition at all, Thompson, replied Jessica, maintaining her composure. Ouch. Good comeback, Lieutenant. But you know how it is, this is a job for real men, said Thompson, laughing with his friends. Jessica clenched her fists, feeling a mix of anger and frustration. She knew that being a woman in a predominantly male environment was already a challenge, but having her competence constantly questioned made things unbearable. As she reached her desk, she looked at the photo of her graduation from the police academy. Dressed in her immaculate uniform, she remembered the pride she had felt that day. I belong here as much as any of you, she muttered to herself. She opened the drawer and took out her badge and gun. As she put them on, she made a silent promise, I will prove my worth, not just to these idiots, but to myself. I am a good police officer, and I will show that to everyone. With this renewed determination, Jessica left the police station, ready to face another day on the streets of Maplewood. She didn't know it yet, but an opportunity to prove her worth was closer than she imagined. Jessica drove her patrol car through the streets of Maplewood with heightened attention. The police radio crackled with occasional traffic calls or minor incidents, but nothing that required her immediate intervention. She was about to change the frequency when her eyes caught something peculiar, a worn-out black hearse slowly approaching on the street. This reminds me of that movie I watched last week, she thought, recalling a scene where a hearse was used to smuggle drugs. Why not? Let's see what's going on here. With a gentle touch on the steering wheel, Jessica maneuvered her patrol car behind the hearse and activated the lights and sirens. The hearse complied and pulled over to the side of the road. She stepped out of the car, adjusted her belt with the badge and gun, and walked toward the vehicle. The driver lowered the window and revealed a tired and irritated face. He was a middle-aged man with gray hair and a stubbled beard. Can I help you, officer, he asked, clearly annoyed. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Lieutenant Jessica Williams. Could you please inform me of your destination and the reason for your trip, she asked, maintaining her firm and professional tone. We're just taking a homeless beggar to the cemetery, replied the driver, who introduced himself as Frank. Is this really necessary? Pulling over a hearse seems a bit, excessive, don't you think? Jessica noticed the tone of disdain in Frank's voice and felt that something was not right. The law applies to everyone, sir, even hearses. And considering that we're in a small town where everyone knows each other, I've never seen you around here. That makes me want to know more. Frank rolled his eyes, clearly upset about being stopped. All right, Lieutenant. But you'll see that you're wasting your time. Jessica smiled faintly, it's my job to make sure I'm not, Mr. Frank. Jessica remained beside the hearse, her piercing gaze fixed on Frank. So, you said you're transporting a homeless beggar, right? Yes, that's correct, Frank replied, crossing his arms and leaning against the car door. A poor soul no one will miss. Jessica jotted down some information in her notepad and then looked at Frank again. And which cemetery are you taking the body to? To Maplewood Cemetery, the only one we have around here, said Frank, appearing increasingly impatient. Understood, Jessica paused, but it's strange because Maplewood Cemetery is in the opposite direction. Frank hesitated for a moment, clearly caught off guard. Oh. I meant we're heading to Willow Creek Cemetery. That's where we're going. The elderly woman we're transporting died of a heart attack, and her family wanted a burial there. 
Jessica raised an eyebrow. Elderly? You didn't mention it was an elderly person earlier. You said it was a homeless beggar. Frank swallowed hard, realizing his mistake. Oh, yes, I misspoke. It's an elderly person. Open the casket. Now, ordered Jessica, her intuition telling her that something was terribly wrong. Frank looked at her, his eyes narrowing. Are you sure? It's a bit disrespectful, don't you think? Disrespectful is lying to a law enforcement officer, Jessica retorted, keeping her hand close to her gun holster, prepared for any eventuality. Open. The. Casket. Frank looked at Jessica with a displeased expression mixed with resignation. All right, you win, he muttered, stepping out of the car and walking to the rear of the funeral vehicle. With trembling hands, he inserted the key and unlocked the compartment containing the casket. Jessica watched Frank's every move closely as he slowly opened the casket lid. There lay the body of an elderly woman, dressed in a simple floral dress with a rosary intertwined between her hands. See? Nothing wrong here, Frank said, trying to hide his nervousness. Jessica looked at the body and felt a wave of disappointment. Maybe I really am wasting my time, she thought. But something didn't seem right. Why are you so nervous? And why is there no procession? It's very unusual to transport a body alone. Frank hesitated before responding. Oh, the family is going through a tough time. They couldn't make it. And I'm nervous because you're making me go through all this embarrassment. Embarrassment? Or could it be guilt? Jessica questioned, narrowing her eyes. You initially said you were transporting a homeless beggar, and now it's an elderly woman who died of a heart attack. Furthermore, you were headed in the wrong direction for either of the cemeteries you mentioned. Do you understand why I'm suspicious, right? Frank swallowed hard, his hands starting to tremble even more. I. I can explain. It's better that you can, Frank. It's better that you can, said Jessica, feeling that she was about to uncover something much more sinister than she had imagined. Jessica was about to reach for her radio to call for backup, her hand almost touching the device, when she felt a sudden and violent impact at the back of her head. The world spun and darkened in an instant. What, was all she managed to think before losing consciousness? The blow likely came from Frank's accomplice, whom she had not noticed hiding in the shadows. When she woke up, darkness enveloped her like a heavy, suffocating cloak. Confused and disoriented, it took her a few seconds to realize where she was. Her eyes adjusted to the dimness, and she saw the serene face of the elderly woman beside her. It can't be. I'm inside the casket, she murmured to herself, panic seeping into every fiber of her being. With adrenaline coursing through her veins, Jessica pushed against the casket lid with all the strength she could muster. Open, damn it, open, she screamed, but the casket wouldn't yield. It was as if it were sealed or reinforced in some inexplicable way. At that moment, she felt the funeral vehicle shaking intensely, as if they were driving on a bumpy dirt road. We're in motion. They're taking me to some remote place, she thought, terror amplified by the sense of helplessness and the swaying of the vehicle. She tried to calm herself, taking deep breaths to conserve the limited oxygen. Think, Jessica, think. You're a police officer, you've been trained for tough situations, she reminded herself, trying to formulate a plan as the car continued to tremble, taking her further into the unknown. The funeral vehicle came to a sudden stop, causing Jessica to be thrown against the side of the casket. She held her breath, hearing footsteps moving away from the vehicle. They got out. What are they planning to do now, she wondered, her heart pounding in her chest. Then, she felt something that made her blood run cold, the distinct sound of dirt falling onto the casket. No, 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 this can't be happening, she muttered, 
panic turning into absolute desperation. She began to push and pound on the casket lid with frenzied urgency, but the sound of the dirt continued, growing heavier with each passing moment, like a doomsday clock ticking away the seconds she had left. It was then that she noticed something that made her stop, a faint, irregular sound coming from beside her. It was the elderly woman, breathing with difficulty. She's alive, Jessica whispered, shocked and relieved at the same time. Suddenly, the elderly woman's eyes opened, revealing cloudy, bewildered blue irises. She looked at Jessica with an expression of bewilderment and fear. Please, help me pound on the casket. We have to get out of here before it's too late, Jessica pleaded, locking eyes with the elderly woman as if her life depended on it, because it really did. The elderly woman, still weak but understanding the gravity of the situation, nodded. Together, they began to pound on the casket lid with all the strength they could muster, each strike a silent cry for help, each second an eternity. Gregory Johnson, a middle-aged man with gray hair and a well-groomed beard, was the caretaker of Willow Creek Cemetery, a secluded and forgotten place on the outskirts of Maplewood. He was in his small cabin, reading a book by the light of an antique lamp when something caught his attention. He looked out the window and saw the headlights of a hearse in the distance, fading away. What the heck? At this hour of the night? Gregory muttered, setting his book aside and grabbing his flashlight. He always found it strange when someone came to the cemetery after dark, but this situation seemed even more unusual. He watched attentively as two men exited the hearse and began to bury a casket. No priest. No family. This isn't right, Gregory thought, feeling a shiver run down his spine. He waited, his gaze fixed on the two men as they finished their work and returned to the car. I'll give them a few minutes to leave. I don't want a confrontation, but this needs to be investigated, he told himself, feeling a mix of curiosity and apprehension. As soon as the hearse disappeared into the darkness of the night, Gregory stepped out of his cabin, locking the door behind him. He grabbed his shovel, which always leaned against the side of the cabin, and began to walk toward the site of the recent burial. Whatever is going on here, I'll find out, Gregory promised, his flashlight illuminating the path ahead as he approached the freshly dug grave. He felt like he was about to uncover something, something that could be both disturbing and dangerous. Inside the casket, Jessica and Martha, the elderly woman who now had a name, were reaching the limits of their strength. Each strike against the lid seemed weaker than the last, and the air inside the casket was growing increasingly thin. I don't know how much longer we can hold on, Jessica said, looking at Martha with eyes filled with concern and exhaustion. Martha, whose eyes now gleamed with a mixture of fear and resignation, nodded. I don't know either, my dear. But at least I'm not alone. Just as they were both losing hope, a noise from above them cut through the oppressive silence. The casket lid was abruptly opened, and intense light flooded the dark space, causing both of them to close their eyes for a moment. It was Gregory, the cemetery caretaker, with a look of shock and disbelief on his face. My God, what, how is this? He couldn't finish his sentence before fainting, collapsing beside the open grave. Jessica, using all her remaining strength, managed to climb out of the casket and crawl to Gregory. She quickly grabbed the man's cell phone, which was attached to his belt, and dialed the emergency number. Hello. I need an ambulance and police reinforcements at Willow Creek Cemetery. We have two people here who were buried alive and an unconscious man, she reported, her voice trembling but determined. While waiting for help, Jessica went back to assist Martha in getting out of the casket. We made it, Martha. We really made it, she said, feeling a wave of relief and gratitude. Martha looked at her, her eyes now filled with tears of relief. Thank God for this man and for you, my dear. You are truly an angel. After the dramatic rescue, the Maplewood police station became a whirlwind of activity. 
Detectives, officers, and even the police chief were involved in the ensuing investigation. Jessica, now treated with a newfound level of respect by her colleagues, was at the center of it all. Mrs. Martha, can you tell us exactly what happened? Detective Harris, a middle-aged man with a serious look, asked as he and Jessica sat across from Martha in an interrogation room. Martha, still shaken but determined to help, began to speak. I was approached by two men who introduced themselves as real estate brokers. They said a big real estate firm was interested in buying my house to build a luxury resort. The offer they made was tempting, so I invited them into my home to discuss the details. And that's when they attacked you? Jessica asked, jotting down every word. Yes, Martha confirmed. As soon as they entered, one of them struck me on the head. The next thing I remember is waking up in that horrible coffin next to you. The investigations were intense and meticulous. With the information provided by Martha, the police were able to identify and arrest the driver of the hearse, a man named Frank Thompson. Under interrogation, Frank broke and revealed the sordid details of their operation. He's part of a gang that specializes in deceiving elderly people to take possession of their properties, Detective Harris announced in a team meeting. They use intimidation tactics, and in extreme cases, even attempt to eliminate their victims to expedite the process. This is monstrous, Jessica said, feeling a mix of relief and indignation. And the other members of the gang? Arrested. All of them, Harris confirmed. Thanks to your work and Mrs. Martha's testimony, we were able to dismantle the entire operation. Jessica looked at Martha, who was sitting next to her. Both exchanged a look of gratitude and relief, knowing that justice would be served. Two weeks after the case was closed, the Maplewood Police Station held a special ceremony. Jessica, dressed in her impeccably aligned uniform, entered the conference room where her colleagues and superiors were already gathered. Lieutenant Jessica Williams, for your exceptional bravery and dedication to duty, you are being promoted to captain, announced Chief of Police Anderson, handing her a new badge and a certificate. Applause filled the room, and for the first time, Jessica felt like she truly belonged to that team. Thank you, Chief Anderson. And thank you all. This is a moment I will never forget, she said, holding back tears of emotion. You deserve it, Jessica. You've proven to all of us what you're capable of, Detective Harris said, approaching to congratulate her. But the real celebration for Jessica came later, in a much quieter setting. She drove to Martha's house, carrying a basket filled with groceries and fresh flowers. Hello, Martha. How are you feeling today? Jessica asked, entering the cozy living room of the elderly woman. Oh, my dear Jessica. I'm feeling much better, especially now that you're here, Martha replied, her eyes gleaming with joy. The two women spent the afternoon together, chatting and laughing like old friends. Martha shared stories from her youth, while Jessica listened attentively, fascinated by the older woman's experiences and wisdom. You know, I never thought I would find a friend in such terrible circumstances, Martha said, pouring another cup of tea for both of them. Neither did I, Martha. But I'm incredibly grateful that we found each other. You've taught me the value of resilience and courage, even when everything seems lost, Jessica replied raising her cup in a silent toast to their unlikely friendship. Both women knew that their lives had been irrevocably changed by those terrible events, but they also recognized that, in some strange and wonderful way, those circumstances had brought them together in a friendship they both deeply cherished. A few months after the case was resolved, Jessica and Martha were invited to speak at a community event on elder fraud prevention. Sitting side by side on the stage, they looked out at the full audience and felt a wave of responsibility and purpose. Good evening, everyone, Jessica began, holding the microphone firmly. We're here today not just as survivors, but as advocates. 
We want to make sure that what happened to us doesn't happen to anyone else. Martha took the microphone and added, it's easy to think that this only happens to others, until you become, the others. Don't let con artists take advantage of you or your loved ones. The event was a resounding success, and soon Jessica and Martha became prominent figures in the fight against elder fraud, participating in awareness campaigns and even helping draft legislation to protect the vulnerable. Meanwhile, Gregory, the cemetery caretaker, was honored at a special ceremony organized by the city. He was presented with a commemorative plaque and a Civic Courage Medal. I just did what I thought was right, Gregory said, visibly moved, as he received his tribute. But I'm glad I made a difference in two people's lives. Jessica and Martha were in the audience, applauding enthusiastically. After the ceremony, they approached Gregory to express their gratitude once again. You're a true hero, Gregory, Jessica said, warmly embracing him. And you'll always be our guardian angel, Martha added, her eyes filled with tears of gratitude. Thanks to this bizarre and dangerous experience, all three of them found a new purpose in their lives. Jessica not only proved her worth but also saved a life and found a cause to fight for. Martha gained a second chance and a lifelong friend. And Gregory, the humble cemetery caretaker, became a local hero, his act of courage serving as an inspiring reminder of the good that a single individual can do.